All right, everyone. I think we're just gonna wait a couple of minutes for more people to stream in and then we can get started. All right, we have a decent amount of people in. I think we can get started. So today we're gonna hear uh, an update from Jeffrey Smith, who's the senior director and the head of patient advocacy at Wave Life Sciences. And he'll be talking to us about, you know, what their programs are and what they've got going on in the hunting industry space. Jeffrey, do you wanna take it away? Absolutely, great, thank you so much. Uh, and I, I really appreciate this opportunity. And I just wanna um, just start by recognizing how challenging it's been over the past year uh, for so many families out there, particularly those living with a, a challenging illness like uh, Huntington's disease. So, um, you know, on the other hand, I, I really uh, am grateful for organizations like HDO um, and, and platforms like this, where we can all come together, learn from each other, um, empower each other, connect, uh, engage. And um, it's just um, a wonderful opportunity. So I just want to uh, extend my appreciation to HDO, um, Matt and the team. I know how challenging it's, it's likely been setting this up and waiting a year um, after the first one was, was postponed. So I appreciate all your work on that. Um, so my name is Jeff. I, I, I lead patient advocacy at WAVE. I'm excited to have the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about WAVE, what we do in our research in HD and what you can expect um, over the coming weeks uh, and months from us. Uh, and I, you know, I, I like to pause here. I think this is likely a slide that um, many of you have seen before. Um, you know, I want to share with you a little bit about what the slide means and, and what it means to me. So what it means is we'll, we're going to be using forward looking statements uh, in this presentation. And what it means to me uh, is that, um, you know, research is uncertain. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, obviously, we're, we're very hopeful, but we don't know what's going to happen. That's why we're, we're conducting the research. And so we do have to use terms um, like may, will, should, um, think we expect to see, um, uh, and hope um, to reflect the uncertainty that research brings with it. On the other hand, though, um, it is a hopeful time. And Mustafa and I were, were actually just talking about all of the, the research that's going on in HD right now. It's a far different place than it was uh, 20 or even 10 years ago. Uh, and that is hopeful for all of us, um, uh, us at WAVE certainly, but uh, our peer companies and the academic researchers that are really um, helping us understand the biology of HD that's gonna hopefully lead to innovations and, and um, you know, treatments and, and uh, solutions for families in the future. So WAVE, uh, we're a genetic medicines company uh, and, and we're focused on treatments for uh, genetic genetically defined illnesses like HD, but not only HD. Uh, we also have research in ALS, uh, frontotemporal dementia, and shed muscular dystrophy. Um, HD, though, is our, where our lead candidates are. We have um, you know, a unique approach, to which I'll talk a little bit about, um, selectively lowering the mutant Huntington while preserving uh, as much as we can of the, of the healthy wild-type Huntington protein. Uh, we currently have two candidates in, in development and expect to have a third here very soon. And I'll talk about that. And this is, this is a, a view of what that uh, HD uh, pipeline currently looks like for us at WAVE. Uh, and so, you know, while, while we, we talk about our, our research approach being unique, we also talk about our culture being unique. And it's a culture of uh, a commitment to listening. Um, listening, learning, understanding the perspectives of individuals and families, and really bringing that into the company um, to drive all of our activities, all of our research, and everything we do in the company. Uh, we're inspired by the stories we hear, um, and I, you know, just want to take a minute to thank all of the the you know the brave individuals who have already shared their um, their story here during the Congress, even before this, with us, with others. Um, sharing your unique uh, experience is so important for organizations like us 
Uh, every voice is unique, every voice is important, and every voice should be heard. And um, that's something that we, we aim to do um, a, a lot of, uh, getting a diverse perspective so that we get a complete understanding of HD so that we can then um, use that understanding to drive uh, potential solutions. It's what we aim to do. And um, I just want to thank all those who have already shared, you know, your story uh, with, with us. Um, and there's been so many and, and we look forward to others in the future. Uh, so I want to share a little bit about the rationale of our research approach in HD and starting with, um, you know, what will be a recap for many um, around the genetics of HD, uh, maybe illustrated in a slightly different way uh, on, you know, what I, the, the take home here is what you see at the top, both the, the loss of healthy Huntington protein and the gain uh, of the, the mutant, the CAG repeat, um, you know, the toxic Huntington protein both occur in HD. And what we're finding is that both of those are likely to be important in the, the manifestation and progression of HD. Uh, and what this, the illustration here shows, um, you know, is that essentially. So in the top we have, uh, you know, what, what you would see in a healthy individual, um, where you have two copies of the um, Huntington gene. Uh, in this case, it's a healthy individual, they'd be a wild type Huntington gene, the non CAG repeat Huntington DNA. Um, you get, you know, obviously two copies, one from mom, one from dad, and that results in what you would expect to see about, a, you know, 100% of the wild type uh, or the healthy Huntington protein. Uh, in the HD uh, situation down in the bottom, uh, this is where um, you know one of the one of the, the Huntington um, uh, genes that you get from either mom or dad uh, is that CAG repeat. Um, so you have one copy that is going to be a, mult, uh, a mutant Huntington. You have um, a, you know your other copy, which would be the wild type Huntington. And essentially, what that leaves here over on the right is half as much of the wild type Huntington protein that you would expect. Um, in addition to, you know, that, that gain of the mutant Huntington. And what we, we, why this is important is that healthy Huntington is important. That Huntington protein is important, we know, for brain function. Um, and this is just a, a, a very brief high-level summary of um, the different roles that Huntington protein has in the brain uh, in terms of maintaining the, the health and survival of neurons or the cells of the brain, supporting a response to stress, regulating communication uh, between neurons, which is so important uh, for function, and helping to circulate fluids that, uh, that your neurons are going to need to, to survive and, and thrive. And so with that, that, that leads to our approach to HD and the objectives of our approach, first and foremost, to be, you know, to, to slow the progression uh, of HD. And we do that by lowering uh, that toxic mutant Huntington protein while uh, preserving the healthy as much as possible. So it's, you know, the, the concept is simple. We want to get rid of the bad. We want to keep as much of the good as, as possible. And that's the approach. And hopefully that will enable us to, to treat earlier in the disease course with, with time and understanding of how these, um, these candidates uh, work in the body. Uh, and this is an illustration of how we do that. We use an antisense oligonucleotide. Uh, and, um, you know, here we just illustrate here how that works. So on the left, um, it's your typical process of, um, of going from a, a DNA, which codes for a protein, essentially. Uh, proteins are the, the workers of the body, of the cell. Uh, and on the left side, you, you have, you know, DNA, which is transcribed into RNA which then is translated into your, your protein. On the right, um, we show a, you know, a, a hypothetical situation where you have a, 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 you know, an inappropriate mutation, um, a disease-causing mutation in the DNA that it's carried through to a transcription where it's transcribed into RNA. And here we design, uh, this is where we design an antisense oligonucleotide, which will target that mutated um, RNA transcript uh, so that that is unable to uh, to be translated into the protein. So essentially, by ridding um, the cell as much as possible of that uh, RNA transcript, that mutated RNA transcript, we're able to lower the amount of the protein that is the result of that transcript. And that this you know this process is not 
unique to us. Um, uh, what is unique is how we uh, aim to target specifically the mutant Huntington copy um, and again, leave as much as possible or preserve the, the wild type. And we use, uh, in order to do that, we use what are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, these are normal variations that occur in all of us. Uh, what they do enable us to do though, um, it's kind of like a GPS, uh, a GPS pin on a map. So it enables us to target specifically where we wanna look. And what we've, what we've found to date is that there are specific SNPs specific single nucleotide polymorphisms, which we can target, which occur preferentially on the mutant copy and not on the healthy or wild type copy. And so that's what we essentially what we do to create our, our candidates. And to date, we've found three of those thus far. Um, we've called them SNP1, SNP2, and SNP3. Uh, very clever names. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, while that's not clever, the, the approach is clever to be able to use those, um, again, to, to specifically target the bad, clear out the bad, keep the good as much as we can. Um, and um, these are the candidates that we're currently pursuing. Uh, we've got uh, clinical trials, which I'll describe here in a second, ongoing for SNP1 and SNP2, uh, and we'll be initiating very soon a clinical trial for SNP3, a candidate called Wave 003. WBE003. So let me just go into relatively quickly an overview of the precision HD1 and 2 studies. These were um, the studies, uh, the study names for our um, looking at SNP1 and SNP2, evaluation of SNP1 and SNP2. These are currently ongoing, but very soon we're, we're actually wrapping these up as we speak. Um, so these Studies are uh, phase 1b2a studies, global randomized double blind placebo controlled. The objective is to look at uh, primarily safety and tolerability. There are intrathecal doses and in early manifest HD patients, uh, but also looking at pharmacokinetic, uh, the pharmacokinetics of the candidate, pharmacodynamics, um, biomarker endpoints, like uh, of course we're looking at mutant Huntington and wild type Huntington, uh, and MRI endpoints. Uh, it occurred is occurring in Europe, North America, and Australia. Um, and the administration of both of these candidates, um, in addition to SNP3, which is, which is coming up, uh, is intrathecal um, IT administration by lumbar, by lumbar puncture to get the candidates directly into the, um, the brain and spinal fluid. So these studies uh, we had initial um, data readout in December 2019, supported to continue on in the study. And now this is, um, you know, again, we're analyzing the data very soon, and we expect to be able to share by the end of the first quarter um, the, the results of these two studies. And so just to summarize, um, again, our therapeutic approach in HD is to selectively lower the mutant Huntington protein while preserving as much as we can that, that um, healthy Huntington protein. Uh, two clinical trials ongoing, expecting very soon to be sharing the, um, the data end of the first quarter, which is coming up on uh, very, very quickly here. Um, and we, uh, we will also, in addition to the, the core studies, um, we have uh, open label extension trials that have been initiated uh, for uh, individuals who uh, went through the, the core studies. We'll have data from those open label extension studies. So uh, you know, really good data set, which we'll expect we'll be able to, um, to, to analyze and interpret and be able to determine what those next steps are. So right now we don't know what the next steps are. We have to look at the data, understand the data, what the data are telling us. Um, and then determine what those next steps are. Um, and, you know, and, and in terms of our commitment, um, you know, we, um, in addition to these two studies, initiating a third that that will be initiating as you know as we speak in the in the next in the coming weeks and months. Um, that those that will also be a, a global study. Um, and uh, in total, that will enable us um, because those you know those SNPs uh, don't necessarily occur in everyone. Uh, with HD, um, we will, you know, we, we need to determine 
when we enroll the study, whether or not um, the, those SNPs are associated with the, um, the correct uh, or the, um, the CAG repeat mutant Huntington gene. Um, so we expect with SNP3 that will enable us to, to, um, to target up to 80% of the HD population. And um, the clinical trial application for that third program was filed in the fourth quarter. Again, we expect here very soon to be initiating the studies. Uh, and again, I just want to thank um, HDO and, and all of our collaborators and partners. Uh, we could never have gotten where uh, our research is today without the support uh, and collaboration from the HD community. Um, and in particular, all of the individuals and all of the families who um, have participated in one of our, our research studies or even screened and took the time and effort um, to, uh, you know, talk to their doctor, collaborate with um, a clinical trial site and, and get screened. No, it's not a, a simple thing to do. And we appreciate all of the, the support and, and efforts that uh, all of you and your families have, have taken there. So thank you very much. And that's, um, that's all I had. And I just wanna, again, thank you, Mustafa. Thanks, Matt and the team for the opportunity and happy to, to answer any questions. Cool. Thanks, Jeffrey, for the update. Very interesting stuff going on uh, in WAVE. I think we have a single question so far, uh, which is uh, what does intrathecal mean? Yes, thank you for the question, Brianna. Uh, intrathecal means um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a way of administering um, a candidate medicine, which means um, into the, into the, the um, essentially into the, um, the brain stem. So it's a, a, a lumbar puncture, which is an, um, it's a needle that goes through, um, through your, your back essentially, and enables you to, to get the drug directly into the cerebrospinal fluid. So essentially direct access to the brain. Um, and for um, illnesses uh, of the brain, um, it, one of the really challenging parts of that is, is getting a candidate medicine into the brain. Um, and there's what's called a, a blood brain barrier, which is very challenging to pass through. And that's, you know, your body has that on purpose because you don't want things going in and out of the brain. Um, and so in order to um, surpass that blood brain barrier using intrathecal um, administration often for um, diseases of the brain, and therapeutics for diseases of the brain. Thank you for the question. Cool. So while we wait to see if uh, any other questions come in, I have a question. Sure. So how do you exactly screen for these SNPs? What's the whole process like? For, so for example, if someone wants to you know, reach out to you guys to see if they want to take part in your potential new clinical trial, how, what's the process like? Yeah, uh, thank, thanks. Really good question. Um, I think the, you know, the first step in the process is to, is to really stay close um, to your doctor and, and your care team. Um, that's the first step. And, um, you know, the, the first um, part of the screening would be just to, to um, verify uh, a Huntington's diagnosis. Um, so once the Huntington diagnosis, the, the expanded CAG repeat is verified, there is a separate screening process, which is um, it's uh, specific to WAVE and specific to our studies, which would need to be um, done to make sure that, um, that the SNP uh, is... Um, that the individual has the SNP and it's associated with that um, mutant Huntington copy. So it's a separate screening process that's specific to WAVE. Got it. I think uh, there's a few questions coming in now. Um, so the first one is how is it determined if you're in the 80% that can be targeted? And I think this speaks to, again, the screening yep. process you mentioned. Yeah, so yep. I think when we just... uh, they want to know if it's a blood test or a lumbar puncture. It's a blood test. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charles, for that question. Um, another one is, are the trials focused on manifest HD patients only? So yeah, that's a really good question. What, what's the stage of HD you guys really want to focus on? Yeah, uh, initially it's early manifest HD patients. That's who was enrolled in precision HD one and two, and that's who's likely to be enrolled in, uh, in uh, the SNP three or the WAVE 003 study. Got it. So, yeah, early manifest HD. And uh, do you have like a timeline on when you can expect to start enrolling for the SNP3 study or the, yeah. There's, yeah, there's no timeline. Um, uh, the clinical trial application was already submitted. 
uh, that was submitted uh, in the in the fourth quarter last year. So you know it's really you know right now working with uh, you know regulatory agencies, working with clinical trial sites, working with ethics committees, IRBs, um, and just doing the the, the real kind of hard day to day work to get a site up and and running and, and approved in a particular country and region. Yeah, got it. Um, yeah, this next question comes from Dr. Bonnie. Uh, what are the pre preliminary results looking like? So if not as successful, if it's not as successful as hoped, what does this mean for future trials? For, I think she's speaking more to the precision one and precision two trials. Yeah, thank, thank you for the, the question, um, Dr. Bonnie. I, you know, I, I don't think I can, um, I can speak to that right now. I, I think you know it's we're a few weeks away, um, if that, from taking a look at the complete data set. And I think until we really look at the complete data set, um, and as I mentioned, we've got um, you know data from multiple doses in the core studies. We've got multiple doses in the uh, open label extension studies. There's just a lot of you know a lot of data from MRI, from um, biomarker studies, safety tolerability. I think you know we're really just going to have to look at the totality of the data, understand what the data are telling us. Um, you know, talk to um, you know our clinical partners like yourself, um, and and really come to an interpretation about what it means. Um, does it you know does it mean we we go on and do a, a much larger, longer study, which is you know what would what the next step would be, um, or you know or something else? So I think until we take a look at the, the totality of the data, we'll be able to answer that, that question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's another question from Tina who asks, assuming there's good results at the end of uh, precision one and two, again, uh, this is a if question, what's the earliest you think, given that everything works out, you could get a product out? Yeah, I, I wouldn't wanna try and time that. Um, what I would say is the next step would likely be a, a longer and larger study. Um, so, you know, these studies were first in human, looking at safety, tolerability in small numbers of individuals um, and looking at dosing, dosing up. Um, so really trying to get a, you know, a preliminary understanding of the, the candidate. And so the next step would be to, you know, select a, a dose or doses to go to a much bigger study to really establish the safety and effectiveness of the candidate. And so, you know, I wouldn't wanna put a timeline on that, but it would, it, it will take some time. And, um, and I think that's probably not an answer that, you know, that folks wanna hear. Uh, it's not one that I, you know, like to give, but it, you know, it really, research takes time um, and, it, and it doesn't go as fast as we all want it to go. And I- oh, yeah. Definitely, I think that's absolutely the correct answer, just to let everyone know that research is a long process and you definitely don't wanna rush things, especially in a clinic trial. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is actually a really qu good question coming from Harriet. Do you know if any of the SNPs uh, targeted are common? What's the variation like in the population? So you mentioned 80% of overall coverage. Is there one that's more common than the others? Uh, we do know that, I don't, I don't have the the data on that offhand. We did we did uh, publish a um, an observational research study on that. Um, what I can tell you is SNP SNP three uh, occurs from our I believe from our, our published um, study was occurred in about forty percent of individuals. Um, SNP one and two together occurred in about seventy percent of individuals. Put those together, there is some overlap. So there are folks who will have you know SNP three and either SNP one and two. Altogether, um, with the three SNPs, it will there will be you know we expect around eighty percent of the uh, you know of individuals with HD will have one of the three SNPs. Got it. Um, this is a question by Brianna, more for the clinical trial administration. So she asks if there are multiple lumbar puncture injections when you sorry not uh, yeah. So she asks if there are multiple lumbar puncture injections, but I think she means what she really means is intrathecal injections? Yes. Um, or it's just one when you administer, administer the ASO? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are multiple. So um, right now the dosing has been monthly for um, the, 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 um, the precision HD1 and 2 candidates. 
um, it has been monthly. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it'll, it'll depend on, again, what we see in the data and whether um, it remains monthly or whether we, you know, try to, um, you know, try to, um, you know, whether the pharmacokinetics enable us to adjust that. Uh, and then um, we'll see what, um, I, I, I don't think, you know, we'll see what SNP 3 is, but I think the expectation is, you know, on the order of um, chronic administration, once a month or something along those lines. Cool, thanks. I think uh, this is the last question. So if you have any other questions, please use the Q&A function. So the last question is, will there be any smartphone-based digital biomarkers that you're thinking around for future uh, trials? We're, we're certainly exploring that, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we've, um, I, I would you know, certainly be interested in people's experience with that, but this is something that we're, we're exploring um, both to, uh, you know, make sure that we're capturing um, outcome measures that are meaningful to participants, and you know, if it also enables us to, uh, you know, to monitor remotely rather than have people, you know, need to travel into clinic. I think you know that would be great. I, we're exploring all those things, um, and um, certainly would be interested in people's experience and, and we, we have reached out to folks to, to talk about experience. So, All right. Uh, lots of exciting stuff going on both at Wave and other companies. And again, this goes back to your earlier observation that 10 to 15 years ago, there was really not much. And now there's suddenly a lot of companies that are working on HD, which is always a good sign and gives us hope. Absolutely. Right. I think uh, there's one more question that came in. Um, is there anything, this is again from Tina, is there anything we can learn from the speed at which COVID research was conducted? Yeah, you know, I was, I was thinking about this actually. Um, you know, I think, I think there is, certainly. Uh, I, I, you know, I think what we have seen with the vaccine research um, is a couple things. Um, number one, what we can accomplish when we concentrate the mind. Um, this is a challenge that the whole world wanted to tackle. The whole world came together um, to help make it happen. Uh, I, I think what um, what folks may not realize is that some, you know, the research hasn't just occurred in the last year. You know, a lot of the research on the mRNA, mRNA vaccines and things have been, um, you know, built over years and years, um, which enabled them to move really quickly here. So, you know, I, I think they're. Um, there are some lessons to be learned. Um, they, they obviously had a, um, you know, a very engaged, um, you know, base of participants for clinical research. That was huge to be able to do a 40,000 person um, clinical trial very quickly. Uh, you know, I, I think though that, um, you know, biologically, uh, uh, you know, a virus and fighting an infection is just so very different from intervening in a neurodegenerative illness. Um, and so, you know, I, I, while I think there maybe are some parallels that we can think and we should always learn from other, uh, you know, from other therapeutic areas and other advances, um, but I think, you know, we, we are limited here by biology and our understanding of, um, you know, the brain and HD relative to um, viral infections. I think there's a follow-up question. Uh, has pre preliminary data been published yet? Yes, that has been published. Um, could you kindly share this publication? I guess, where can patients mm -hmm. or family members access that info? Yeah, it wasn't published uh, in a peer-reviewed uh, journal or anything um, quite yet. It was... Um, I, that will be included in the complete data set. That was an initial uh, read. I, you know, we made an announcement um, through a press release and through, um, uh, you know, we actually we, we made it available to the community through a letter to the uh, letter to the community that went to advocacy organizations. Um, but it hasn't been um, published in a in a peer reviewed journal quite yet. Um, Got it. So it's, it big, was just a press release then. Yeah. And we're waiting for more data to come in to be fully analyzed, and then you're going to yeah. publish it. Okay, got it. I think um, that is all. I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for coming on and answering all these great questions. I think it's always nice to 
interact with the community and answer some of their concerns and questions. Yeah, no, thank, thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for, for being on and, and for your engagement in your classroom. So Definitely. Much. So in the next session, I think uh, there's a quick 15 minute session that's uh, going on now with Dr. Michael Hayden, who's giving an update uh, from Prilenia on their work on the proof HD study. All right, thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you for attending and thanks, thanks again, Jeffrey. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks.